Welcome everyone to Lecture 2 of Unit 2, which covers Chapter 4 of the text. The title of the chapter is Sexuality. When most courses cover this topic, they transmit a body of knowledge about human sexual expression. My desire for this course on marriage and family relations is to go beyond this information on human sexuality and have you understand how this material relates to you and how it can improve your intimate relationships. The discussions will give you an opportunity to examine how the information fits into your life. Remember to disclose only what you are comfortable revealing in the discussions. Sex has meaning depending on how we experience it, and it is a common source of conflict for both the individual and society. Most people need sex to have meaning for them. Sex is meaningful on a personal experiential level but also its meaning can involve intimacy, closeness, pleasure, or even as sex therapist Dr. Marty Klein said, the promise that life is okay. Sexual experiences may provide possibilities for both the human body and mind to bond with another. A lot of research on sex involves giving surveys, and that has raised questions about how accurate the results are. Part of the problem is how honest people are being. Another part of the problem is people interpret questions differently. For example, the line between sexual activity and physical affection is not always clear. French kissing is considered sexual activity for some people. People don't agree on which behaviors constitute sex. There is ambiguity about what exactly constitutes sexual involvement. Remember former President Bill Clinton's response that he did not have sexual relations with Monica Lewinsky, despite what many would define as so. Like gender roles, sex is social as well as biological. Sexuality is expressed in ways we learned through socialization. Individuals learn to use social cues to interpret sexual desire and intent. For example, flirting is sometimes used through verbal communication and body language to indicate an interest in a deeper relationship. Because sexual behavior is influenced by socialization, what is considered normal can vary widely across cultures. Research has identified four stages of human sexual response, which reflects the uh, sequence of physical and psychological changes that occur when someone participates in sexual activity. The first stage is excitement, which is the result of physical or psychological stimulation, followed by plateau, which includes a continuing high of arousal, preparing the way for orgasm. Orgasm itself, involving the discharge of sexual tension that has been built up and maintained during plateau. And finally, resolution, which involves the return to a state of being sexually unaroused. Although sex is one of the basic physical drives in humans, the expression of sex is still a social phenomenon. Both gender roles and gender role orientation affect sexual activity. Both genders have needs for sex, but act on them differently based on gender roles. For example, women are expected to be less sexual than men, and men focus on physical aspects of sex, but gender roles themselves may be responsible for these differences. There is an enormous amount of variation in the extent to which people in differing societies and within a particular society are aroused. Such diversity underscores the fact that sexual behavior is learned. In an ideal world, there would be reciprocal desire between two people. But in the real world, there's a good deal of unwanted and coerced sex. It appears that the experience of unwanted sex is fairly common and begins early in life. Women are not always the victims, for women also engage in sexual coercion. Sexual harassment occurs in all kinds of settings and among all ages. And notably, research has found that men are more likely than women to interpret friendly gestures by the opposite sex in sexual terms. And as there is in gender roles, there's variation in sexual orientation. Most people are heterosexual, preferring male-female sexual relations only. Well over 10 million Americans are exclusively homosexual, 
and many more than that have had some homosexual experience. Apart from their differing preferences for relationships, heterosexuals and homosexuals share many of the same meanings of sex. William Masters and Virginia Johnson identified four phases in human sexual response. They actually hooked people up to uh, monitors, various monitors, to measure things like heart rate and muscle tension, and identified bodily changes that characterize each phase. As you can see, Masters and Johnson identified three types of female response and only one type for males. While females are capable of multiple orgasms, males can only have one due to a refractory period. There is the possibility of a second orgasm in males after the refractory period. Knowing how your body responds during each phase of the cycle can enhance your relationship and help you pinpoint and discuss any problems. Sigmund Freud saw sex as a basic instinct. He saw it in more uh, physical terms, as a, as a basic uh, physiological drive. Human love, according to Eric Fromm, does not reflect a Freudian sexual instinct. Rather, the need for intimacy has primacy over sex, as our text points out. Intimacy is a more fundamental need than the need for sex. Sexual relations may be seen as one way to fulfill intimacy needs, but actually most people seem to sense the fact that sex needs to be an expression of love in an intimate relationship. Sexual activity is a natural expression of feelings of intimacy. The majority of teenagers become sexually active between the ages of 15 and 19. Substantial numbers begin sexual activity earlier. Birth rates among teenagers have declined in recent decades. The probability of becoming sexually active varies according to race and ethnicity and other demographic variables. One of the consequences of teenage sex is a high rate of unwanted pregnancies and giving birth at an earlier age. Many teenagers give birth to children who are unwanted at the time of conception, in part because the mother is unmarried. According to a study from the Centers for Disease Control, the teen sex rate is the lowest since the 1980s. The study found that 44% of females and 47% of males in the 15 to 19 year old age group reported having had sex between 2011 and 2013, the years that the teens were surveyed. Those rates have not changed from the previous survey period, although they are much lower than in 1988 when 51% of females and 60% of males in this age group reported having sex. Birth control measures are readily available in most communities, but no contraceptive is foolproof. Many young people fail to use birth control. Not all teenagers find the prospect of pregnancy to be unsettling. Certain parental attitudes and behaviors significantly reduce the likelihood of out-of-wedlock pregnancy. And the chances of pregnancy are higher if a girl is going steady and if she has had discipline problems in school. Whether wanted or not, uh, teenagers differ in important ways uh, when they become parents. Teenagers who father or give birth to children are uh, more likely uh, than those who become parents at a later age to experience a variety of negative consequences. Now this is not to say that uh, all teenage parents have negative consequences. Clearly little positive though can be said for teenage pregnancy and childbearing. The number of teenagers having sex is the lowest in the last 25 years and the use of condoms among teens is slightly higher than in the last 11 years according to the most recent report from the CDC. However, it appears teens have not increased their use of highly effective contraceptive methods such as intrauterine devices and they continue to use withdrawal which is one of the least effective ways to prevent pregnancy. While these statistics seem alarming considering the number of teenagers having sex, we have a few reports that shed light on what might encourage teens to become sexually active uh, in the first place. Uh, perceived peer pressure and family environment 
seem to be factors that may affect young people's decisions to have sex. In a study from the American Public Health Association, researchers at the University of Kentucky followed 950 teenagers at 17 high schools in Kentucky and Ohio from 9th to 11th grades. They found evidence that teens who have intercourse tend to think their friends are too, even if they're not. You're 2.5 times more likely to have sex by the ninth grade if you think your friends are having sex, whether or not they really are. Plus, teens tended to overestimate how many of their friends were sexually active. The good news is that while teen sex may not be wholly preventable, the health risks it involved it involves uh, can be reduced uh, through a communication within the family. More research uh, showed that frequent parent-child discussions about sex and its dangers may prevent teenagers from engaging in risky sexual behavior. Adolescents who felt that their families were more supportive and more open to discussions about sex were less likely to have unprotected sex and thus were at a lesser risk for pregnancy and disease. According to a study by the Kaiser Family Foundation, many teens, especially boys, feel pressure to have sex before they are ready. Some 63% of teens believe that waiting to have sex is a good idea, but not all of them actually do. Abortion is a highly controversial subject. Abortion may be either spontaneous, such as in a miscarriage, or induced by some a medical or surgical procedure. Uh, for every 10 pregnancies, between two and three are aborted. Abortion will probably continue to divide the nation into conflicting camps for some time. Abortion poses psychological risks for some women. There is the possibility of a post-abortion syndrome. A recent study from the University of California, San Francisco, found that the vast majority of women that had an abortion felt they had made the right decision. But about 80% of those who had an abortion reported having primarily negative emotions about their abortion, but still felt they had made the right choice. Some of the symptoms of post-abortion syndrome are guilt, experiencing guilt, does not imply you made a mistake or violated your own moral code, as some pro-lifers might imply. However, feelings around having an abortion may be complex and have to take into account fear of what others might think. Abortion is a distressing experience and can induce post-traumatic stress disorder in some. Some other symptoms of post-abortion syndrome are anxiety, depression, numbness, and in extreme cases, suicidal thoughts. According to the Guttmacher Institute, an organization which uh, does research on sexual and reproductive health worldwide, the number of abortions per thousand women aged 15 to 44 has steadily decreased since around 1981 and has leveled off for the past four or five years. Now, the reasons women give for having abortions underscore their understanding of the responsibilities of parenthood and family life. Three-fourths of women cite concern for or responsibility to other individuals. Three-fourths say they cannot afford a child. Three-fourths say that having a baby would interfere with work, school, or the ability to care for dependents. And half say they do not want to be a single parent or are having problems with their husband or partner. Now abortions are going down but ironically in the United States two of the states which have new restrictions have seen increases in abortion. Louisiana and Michigan for example. Now one factor in the decrease in, in abortions overall is the decline in teen pregnancy which in 2010 reached its lowest level ever. Some experts contend that the decreased rates are due to uh, better access to contraception and comprehensive sex education in schools. Uh, they believe these two factors are responsible as they decrease unwanted pregnancies. Another reason for the decrease may be due in part to expanded access to long-lasting contraceptive methods that are uh, now more fully covered by health insurers under the Federal Affordable Care Act and Medicare expansion 
in some states, and I'm referring to IUDs and contraceptive implants. Premarital sex occurs in all societies. One outcome of the power struggle in terms of interactions between men and women is the double standard, a long-standing fixture of American society that favors male interests. To some extent, the double standard has changed premarital sexual activity uh, as reactions to the double standard have made it nearly as acceptable for females as for males. Although the double standard accepted the fact that most boys would have premarital sexual uh, experiences, it did not mean that such behavior was considered ideal. Whether people believe that premarital sex is wrong depends on sex, age, education, race, and religion. Now this is important. Attitudes do not necessarily reflect behavior. The amount of premarital sex has increased considerably in recent decades. By the mid-1990s, nearly 70% of never married women aged 15 to 44 years reported having had sexual relations. Whether sex occurs during dating depends on a number of factors. Those who are in fairly equitable relationships have the most sexual intercourse. As in the case of dating patterns, premarital sexual behaviors depend on several background factors, including race, religion, and family background, including parental and sibling behavior. When it comes to extramarital sex, clearly most Americans practice fidelity, but many people do engage in extramarital sex. Many married people fantasize about what it would be like to have sex with someone other than their spouse. But fantasies are not usually enough to motivate someone to have extramarital sex. For women, the main motivator seems to be a sense of emotional need. For men, it's more likely to be a purely sexual motivation. Some people report that the extramarital experience provided them with a brief but meaningful thrill. But there's also the possibility of crisis in marriage if the extramarital affair is discovered. Many couples are able to work through these challenges to intimacy and actually come out on the other side with much stronger marriages. Various outcomes of infidelity are possible, including divorce. The text points out that even though most Americans express disapproval of extramarital sex, a substantial number will have extramarital affairs. Getting or the fear of getting a sexually transmitted disease can lower or even eliminate the intimacy of sexual relations and discourage extramarital affairs. Sexually transmitted diseases have plagued humankind throughout history. The major types of sexually transmitted diseases are AIDS, gonorrhea, syphilis, genital herpes, and chlamydia. Let's run down some of the major types of sexually transmitted diseases. AIDS, which is caused by a virus that attacks certain white blood cells, eventually causing the individual's immune system to stop functioning. Gonorrhea is one of the oldest forms of sexual disease. It can be transmitted by any kind of sexual contact, including kissing. Syphilis can be transmitted by sexual contact, but can also be transmitted in a blood transfusion or, if a pregnant woman acquires it, to the fetus. Genital herpes is transmitted by sexual intercourse and shows up in the form of painful blisters on or in the area of the genitals. There is no cure for genital herpes. Chlamydial infections usually have no symptoms and can cause infection of the urethra in males and infections in the reproductive system in females. There is a lot of concern over STDs today, especially after a recent report from the CDC. Reported cases of three STDs, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis, have increased for the first time since 2006, according to data published by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the 2014 STD Surveillance Report. Reported cases of chlamydia are up 2.8% since 2013. Rates of primary and secondary syphilis, the most infectious stages of syphilis, and gonorrhea have both increased by 15.1% and 5.1% respectively. 
and STDs continue to affect young people, particularly women, most severely. But increasing rates among men contributed to the overall increases across all three diseases. Just some final thoughts as uh, I complete this uh, overview uh, of the chapter. Uh, the text includes a, a chart of various methods of birth control, and uh, it includes the advantages and disadvantages of uh, each type. Uh, I encourage you to uh, take a look at that uh, chart. And most Americans say that a good sex life is very important to a successful marriage. And the sex life of married couples has changed considerably. On average, Americans have sexual relations about once a week. The extent to which sexual satisfaction is important to marital satisfaction really depends on how important sexual satisfaction is to the individual partners. Sexual satisfaction involves more than just intercourse. Sexual satisfaction is less important than the quality of an intimate relationship. The relationship between sexual satisfaction and marital satisfaction is one of mutual influence. Perhaps the most obvious change in sexual activity over the course of a marriage is the decline in frequency. Still, sexual activity remains strong and important to many people as they age.